Hello, uh, my name is Mario Ibarra Jr. and uh, I'm an artist from here in Los Angeles. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of things. Um, for the first part, I want to talk about uh, growing up uh, here in my neighborhood in Wilmington, California. Uh, Wilmington, California is an interesting place. It's one of the oldest uh, neighborhoods or barrios in Los Angeles City. Uh, we're here at the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, the Port of Los Angeles uh, here was founded by a man named Phineas Banning. Phineas Banning was originally from Wilmington, Delaware. And when he moved out here uh, in relationships to some kind of manifest destiny uh, to Los Angeles, he settled here in the port area, the harbor area. It wasn't the port at that time. At that time, it was little more than a pirate's cove. Uh, with the surrounding area of San Pedro and Terminal Island, which at that time was called Rattlesnake Snake Island. Uh, in 1856, I believe, he founded the city here of Wilmington. Uh, he built a large Greek revival home uh, about a mile away from the water uh, where he had a vestibule on the top of his house that he could see with the large telescope uh, what uh, ships were coming into the harbor here. Uh, he was also responsible for bringing in the railroad uh, to the harbor, uh, which uh, really opened up shipping into Los Angeles and uh, founded the industry that we know today here uh, with the ports of LA and Long Beach. It, uh, we believe they're the fifth largest port uh, in the world, uh, the first largest port in the Americas, um, and uh, so that makes for an interesting kind of background or backdrop. Uh, over the years, of course, uh, all, most of the ports here have become automated and containerized. Uh, containerization came into play in maybe I think the late 70s or 80s. I think the first ones were in the 60s, but we didn't really start seeing all the cargo convert to containers uh, until about the 1980s. Uh, the port uh, is uh, ran or, or manned, I should say, uh, by the International Longshoremen Warehousemen's Union. Uh, you know, my, uh, that, that makes up for the majority of uh, the employment here in, Los Ange in the Los Angeles port and in the area of Wilmington. Uh, Wilmington is its official name, uh, but uh, everybody around these parts calls it Wilmas. Uh, there are initially three barrios that make up Wilmas. You have uh, West Side Wilmas, uh, East Side Wilmas, and North Side Wilmas. I guess if there were to be a South Side Wilmas, it would be the actual port itself. Uh, so yeah, uh, Wilmas is also the, the, the rival gangs here in the neighborhood. Uh, East Side and West Side Wilmas have been at a kind of civil war since about the 1970s and uh as always it has become a, a real kind of a interesting paradox or irony in that uh phineas banning uh during the civil war in order to make kind of headway with the u.s government and to bring in contracts etc uh paid the u.s uh union uh government a large amount of money to become an honorary general here uh in the neighborhood I mean, in Wilmington and here on the West Coast. And to hold that uh, title of honor of general, he had to man uh, troops. So he built, I think, a 20 acre or so uh, compound uh, that held a camel troop. Uh, they thought since this area was mostly marshlands at that time, that camels will have a better time walking around the area as opposed to horses because the camel's hoofs were broader and wider than the horses. They also brought in a, a Persian men, uh, Turkish men, to teach the troops how to ride and use uh, the camels um, as transport and as for transport for uh, you know supplies. Um, so, so Wilmington has had this interesting history of uh, having having an official history, which is that. There's a Wilmington Historical Society, which is manned by two people, and they keep all the microfilms and all the high school yearbooks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, being so close to Terminal Island and close, in, close to the fishing community, 
uh, pre-World War II, a large majority of the population in the high school, I saw the yearbooks from the 1930s, uh, were mostly Japanese Americans. And then post-internment uh, during World War II, a lot of the Japanese didn't return to this area. But there are some interesting stories about Japanese in this area during that time. For example, one of my best friends, uh, Steve Delatori, his family is the Delatori family that are famous for uh, founding the Juanita's Menudo factory that on the side of its, uh, its building on a silo that contains corn reads, life without Mexican food is no life at all. Well, anyway, his grandfather uh, was one of the founder, founders of Juanitas, and uh, he was married to a Japanese woman. His first wife was a Japanese woman, and uh, they had you know, mixed race babies, Mexican and Japanese babies. Uh, and during World War II, uh, the woman never left the house. She didn't get interned, but she never left the house for fear of being interned, seeing that she was Japanese. Uh, and her kids were Hapa, I guess you would call them, mixed race children. Uh, and they lived life as, as Mexican children. And, but all the community and the surrounding community, all the ladies would give uh, for her food and bring her food, etc., so it's kind of an interesting version of like a kind of Japanese uh, Anne Frank here in Wilmington. An interesting relationship to the Japanese history here in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, it's also a violent history here, uh, going back to the Civil uh, War history, which never fought a battle, never shed any blood here in this area. But the opposing gangs, which uh, you know are very equivalent to northern and southern. Uh, brothers within the Confederate and Union Army uh, fight here regularly, uh, you know, and have been uh, a lot of deaths and rivalry between the different sides of Wilmas here. Uh, last year, it kind of came to a head. We had about 12 murders in the first part of the 2012. This year, it's calmed down, but it always goes back and forth. So though we have a, a, a Civil War monument here in the Drum Barrack building, uh, we have no monument to the Civil War that has been fought here for over three or four generations between the different sides of the barrio. So that being said, I wanted to give you some context uh, to Wilmington. Uh, you know, I grew up on the north side of Wilmington, uh, across the street from uh, Broad Avenue Elementary School. Uh, my address was 24620 Broad Avenue right across the street from the jungle gym and the blacktop at the elementary school. Uh, you know, I grew up with about seven boys. Uh, they were, you know, the Alvarez brothers, uh, the Cerna brothers, uh, Angel Montez, uh, myself, and Martin Martinez. Uh, you know, we grew up playing, and uh, that was our core uh, group of playmates, and boys on the block, you know. There were other brothers and sisters in the family, but for the most part, we stuck together. Uh, I was the youngest of the group, uh, kind of bookending the, the kids uh, there. The kids younger than me kind of played with each other while I hung out with the older boys, um, which made it really tough because they were always bullying me, throwing things, tying me up, throwing things at me, beating me up. I guess that led to me being a little bit tough because uh, they could beat me up, but no other kids from any other block would ever be able to touch me. Uh, that was funny. Uh, funny, interesting kind of way that uh, male show uh, bonding. I remember one time I got a black eye from a kid that lived on the next block over and they followed him on his bicycle route and uh, gave him a black eye too. And the next day, I remember playing with him in the schoolyard, both of us with black eyes. And um, we've been good friends ever since. Uh, so those types of things were how we grew up. And it was interesting because we were always uh, daring each other uh, to outdo one another. Uh, anywhere from, you know, jumping our bicycles over ditches that we had dug uh, to lighting uh, paper on fire in the ditches so we could jump over the ditches a la Evil Knievel, uh, jumping off of roofs of the schoolhouse, uh, anything that we could do to outdo each other, uh, we tried to do and uh, uh, we had a blast doing it. Uh, 
we also socialized each other, I guess, in an interesting way using comedy. Uh, I remember one of the first games that we played when we were children was called Make Me Laugh. And uh, <laughs> we would uh, all sit on a bench and it would be somebody's, would be it. And that person that was it would stand in the front of us and pull off some kind of routine, some kind of act. And then the first person who would laugh would become it and have to go up and make somebody laugh. And I remember each one of us had our own different types of routine. Uh, mine was kind of gross, but it was burp talking. You know, I would I would sit up in front of them and I would uh, take a deep breath and I would go like, I can't even do it today. And uh, <laughs> it was kind of difficult for me to do now, but then I would do it really well and everybody would laugh. And then Ruben, I remember he would play the role of a kind of Down syndrome kid uh, and pull his pants all the way up to his chest and he'd pull his hat real low over his eyes and <laughs> make us all laugh. Yeah, so we would do that. And then as we grew up into teenagers, uh, we would host people on our block, you know, because people started getting cars and they would come hang out on our block and at that time, too, we were introduced to a new way of making money, which was selling crack cocaine. Uh, you know, for $20, you could go buy what was called a double up. So they'd give you twice amount the, the dope that your $20 would buy, and then you could sell that and then uh, make your money. And, uh, you know, some of the guys that I grew up with, uh, that was just the beginning for them, that $20. And then they grew into uh, doing all kinds of things and moving drugs all over the country. And they ended up going to federal prison uh, for very long-term sentences, like 10 to 14 year long sentences for uh, the transportation of narcotics. And we also got into all kinds of other things that maybe we shouldn't have got into, but struck our curiosity. My friend Richard, you know, uh, I remember when he was 16, he bought a big 357 Magnum, it's a huge gun. And uh, he wanted to shoot it so bad, I remember. And we went onto the top of the roof of his house and we were looking at the elementary school and there was a tree and behind the tree we thought we saw what was a cat a black cat and uh he said oh should i shoot the cat and i said no nah, don't shoot the cat because he had a cat and i had a cat so he kind of had soft spots for cats so i said no nah, don't shoot the cat just shoot the building so said, well, it must have been like one or two in the afternoon with this 357 on the top of his garage pointed at an elementary school and he shot the gun. Boom! I remember it was the loudest sounding, cracking, thunderous sound I remember. Bam! And, you know, boom, I saw it hit the wall and the stucco fell off. And I remember this hole being there. And then uh, about two minutes later, from behind the tree, what we thought was a cat ended up being a couple making out. And it was the girl's head. Uh, imagine if we would have shot that girl in the head that day. We would have, jeez, what a terrible day that would have been. But anyway, uh, so this involvement of guns and crack cocaine uh, really plighted us as young people. And uh, also with the deep emergence of kind of hardcore rap music, things like N.W.A., et cetera, et cetera, uh, really fueled us into a, 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 a place that, uh, that I think now has us suffering from a bit of post-traumatic stress. Um, why Richard, the person with the 357, my best friend, ended up uh really murdering within the within a month or two months of that time he shot and killed a, a another boy a 12 year old boy on the street uh, in a kind of drive-by shooting and then he was caught that same afternoon and um and has been serving a life sentence ever since so he's been in prison since he was 16 and i was 14 and in the next couple of months i'll be 40 years old so he's been in prison over 20 four odd 23 24 odd years um that kind of led us to a really weird uh space on my block uh with the absence of our friend who was like a key member of our group uh that led to murders on our block and all kinds of things happening to us uh, uh fortunately enough i was able to go to a drug rehab when i was about 14 years old kind of put me in a space of understanding uh, psychology, uh, not only about others, but about myself. And then I was able to go back to school after that experience, and I, I finished high school. 
I graduated in 1991 from Phineas Banning High School. It was a fun place to go to school, man. It was a lot of it was a blast. At that time, we had a really great football team. A lot of uh, black kids were being bussed in from different parts of the city. Uh, we had a lot of Polynesian kids there. A really, you know, I wouldn't say the most diverse, uh, but we had a pretty diverse uh, population of students there. Uh, mostly Mexican American, but we did have other people around us. Uh, the teachers at that time were still kind of old school, uh, coming, still being there since the 1970s or before that. I remember my art teacher was the same art teacher my father had 20 some odd years before I got there. And I remember the first day of class uh, in 10th grade in the art class, and the teacher's name was Mr. Johnson. He called out, Mario Ibarra, and I said, here. And he looked up and he said, didn't I have you in my class 20, 20 years ago? I said, no, that was my dad. But he was a great guy. Uh, he let us uh, explore a lot in relationship to creating and making art. Mr. Johnson did. Uh, you know, at that time, it was pretty rough in school, so he would let us you know, the kids that were interested in art stay in the back room all day and make art. I guess that was alternative to getting into trouble in other places. Um, and that kind of fueled, uh, or began for me, a lifelong love of art uh, and art education and, and making art with people and having people around me. Um, yeah. Banning High School, 1991. And I then went through a series of kind of odd jobs and training centers and junior colleges. Uh, then I found that uh, you could get into art school uh, with just a portfolio. You know, my grades were okay, but uh, in junior college and all that, I had never really finished anything other than my art courses. Anything that was a general uh, c uh, class, I never finished. So. I know I got I got lucky and I was able to apply portfolios to Otis College of Art and Design and to Art Center and uh, in Pasadena and I was accepted to Otis's summer program I guess a trial program before you know to test if you want to go there it was mostly filled with teenagers I was a little bit older I was about 20 but uh, I was able to go there and then at Art Center, I went to a night class that was a strictly design class, which was, I, I dropped out midway through. It was too much for me. All the, student, all the students were kind of uh, working professionals that were coming in at night to do extension coursework, and that wasn't for me. Uh, so I, I entered Otis the, that fall, I believe it was 94 or 95, and uh, I entered into that program there at Fine Arts School, and I was really lucky to find a really uh, interesting group of uh, peers uh, Ruben Ochoa, uh, Eduardo Sarabia, uh, Juan Capistran, etc. And uh, Ruben Ochoa, along with his friends, had formed a group called LASSO, the Latino Artist Student Organization. And they held exhibitions and poetry readings. And it was a great uh, kind of group to have around as peers and to, to feed off of. At that time, it was kind of a uh, nerd uh, wars. Because I remember Ruben Ochoa would be checking out books. And at that time, when you checked out a book, you had to fill out a card and put your name on it. And then I would see that he had the book. And then I would really want the book. And then we'd go back and forth. And, you know, I was trying to look at all this stuff. And he was trying to look at all this stuff. And it really fueled a kind of competition between us, which I think is really uh, vital to any process, to have friendly competition, uh, to have somebody to p compete against. It just... It just puts you on your A game and, and, and makes you a little bit more conscious and aware of what you're doing. Uh, then I finished uh, Otis in 1999. I got my bachelor's degree from Otis. And then I went straight into graduate school at UC Irvine, uh, mostly because I wanted to work with Daniel J. Martinez. He had been a kind of art hero of mine, and I had written several papers about him. And uh, he was the only Mexican-American person to be uh, teaching at the graduate level in the U.S., I think, at that time, uh, in the art program. So I was able to work with him, and he instilled a real deep sense of thought and kind of fight in me and, uh, and, a, and, a, and taught me how to become a strategist. Not that I hadn't had that before, but he just really highlighted that for me and made it clear. You know, in my undergraduate education, I had worked with Ruben Ortiz Torres, uh, which he was, he really uh, brought together this like, notion of kind of hybridity and uh, a kind of work ethic 
So between the both of them, Ruben Ortiz Torres and uh, Daniel J. Martinez, I think I had a really good uh, uh, foundation for setting off into my own practice. I finished graduate school in 2001, and uh, the next year with my friend Juan Capistran and my wife Carla Diaz, uh, she wasn't my wife at that time, but my girlfriend, uh, we started a studio here in Wilmington called Slanguage Studio. A lot of people ask why Slanguage? Um, and it was just a kind of continuation of these kind of intervention projects that Juan and I were doing. I guess you call it street art now, uh, that we thought would be an interesting name, the idea of street language, slanguage. Uh, and then also kind of proposing from this Blade Runner film where they talk this gibberish in the future here in Los Angeles, uh, kind of hybridization of different languages. We thought that maybe we could use that as a kind of starting point. Um, this language was originally intended to be our studio uh, to make art, but then young people uh, from the neighborhood here started knocking on the door, and they wanted to make art too. And they would come in and they would, oh, Mario, I want to draw. Well, here's paper, go over there. Oh, I want to paint. Here's some paint, go over there. And that led to one thing to another to where then we uh, had a full-blown education program here where the first artists that worked with us were uh, the teachers, than young kids and teens from the community were the students. We also did exhibitions, uh, discussions, community days. We were deeply involved in, uh, in creating a new generation of artists here in the neighborhood. And uh, the Slanguage Project ran from 2002 to 2012. August 15th is our anniversary. Uh, last year, uh, 2012, we were part of the LA, Made in LA, uh, Los Angeles first Biennale, and we took over LAX Art uh, with a three month exhibition and programming run, um, trying to touch on or show people the model of the things that we did here at Slanguage. You know, Slanguage was a, a very intricate and uh, an involved project. You know, we got to know a lot of these people on a personal level. The artists that worked with us, the community directly around us, and uh, we were able to to do a lot, accomplish a lot. A lot of the young artists that worked with us did go on to school, uh, came back, formed their own organizations, their own kind of practices, um, and we 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 liked that. Um, we, we weren't necessarily interested in them continuing this language project, but in essence, they do uh, continue this language project in their projects. Um, you know. Not unlike uh, Carla and I following the example that we got from our mentors at uh, Homeland Cultural Center in Long Beach through Manasar Gamboa and Dixie Swift. Um, both of them really showed us uh, a great model. And that, that model is, when people ask me, it isn't so much about uh, what we were doing in, in terms of how we were learning to teach uh, per se, but I think the word is how we were learning to facilitate the needs of the community because um, uh, for example when we were young and we went to homeland and we would ask Dixie about running a workshop or having an exhibition she would quickly figure out a way to facilitate our ideas they weren't necessarily just her ideas uh, that we just were implements for but we she would help to facilitate our ideas using the resources that she had and her position that she had and influence that she had uh, in the city of Long Beach. And um, that's what we were trying to also m model ourselves after here. So when young people would come in with ideas for exhibitions or workshops or artworks, we would try to really uh, facilitate their needs uh, to pull the sources that resources that they had, of course, and then to also uh, help buttress their ideas and uh, their uh, wishes and concerns and desires with the resources that we have. Um, so it makes it a little bit different um, from just passing on the known, which is teaching, to really reaching in uh, past uh, that into some unknown territory where you don't necessarily know exactly what that person's vision is, but you might have an inkling and you might have a way to kind of help jumpstart their ideas. Um, in essence, that's what the Slanguage Project was. Um, during that time, I was, that 10 year span, I was also very fortunate to be able to uh, maintain uh, 
a kind of art practice of my own, being able to travel uh, throughout the United States and Europe, taking part in the 2008 Whitney Biennial, uh, exhibiting at the Tate Modern in London, uh, being part of an exhibition called The Uncertain States of America, uh, which traveled all throughout the uh, Europe. Um, so it was just a really kind of rewarding uh, past time. I was also able to teach institutionally at all kinds of schools, from Williams College in Massachusetts uh, to the California College of Arts in uh, San Francisco, uh, also at Otis College of Art and Design, uh, UC Irvine. And for the past four years, I was teaching uh, new genres courses at UCLA. And as of late, uh, this past year, I did a teaching residency at the CalArts. And um, now I'm at a, a kind of a place where I'm kind of reeling all this stuff in to focus on my own uh, art practice here in the studio. So kind of public projects and educational projects such as language have kind of taken a, a kind of hold or a pause. Uh, teaching, I am going to take a, a year or two off of from teaching institutionally at the art schools and focus on a kind of pedagogical apprentice-based uh, practice uh, here in the studio. Um, I just opened a new space uh, up uh, the beginning of this year, 2013, uh, 618 Avalon Boulevard, which is called The Third World. Uh, the Third World is a, a creative space, of course, was more of a thinking space, a research space, a discussion space, a place for ideas to kind of develop. Um, I'm looking forward to putting into play a lot of strategies and equations that I have for sculptural work, uh, as well as some uh, design work. I uh, have several projects on the plate right, on my plate right now, uh, some in collaboration with my wife Carla and some solo projects. Um, I'm doing a project with the Philadelphia Workshop Museum. Uh, we're working also with the Philadelphia Mural Program. Uh, I, have a solo, I have a solo exhibition that will be coming up next year at Michael Jansen Gallery. Uh, we're working on several program projects, one with Don Hirschner who is the owner of the Chinese theater in uh, Hollywood. Uh, and the list goes on. Several personal projects, painting projects, etc. cetera. Um, so that's where we are right now. And I'm looking uh, interested into my, my birthday, which is coming up in uh, October. I'll turn 40. So uh, I'm hoping that I can aspire to and achieve some of these goals that I have for myself. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited because I feel like I have a, an, an interesting team gathered around me you know people that are are really great at what they do and really enthusiastic about what they do and a really smart team and they they take it very seriously and uh i'm really fortunate to have these people around me and i'm looking forward to see what we can create together and uh that's about it for today thank you for listening uh here from slanguage studio 640 avalon boulevard wilmington california peace <laughs>